All right, so just to catch us up now, we started the book of Revelation off, beginning with John's vision that he saw on the Isle of Patmos. The Lord um, told him of the things that had taken place, that things that are as they are now and things that will take place soon in the future. So he gave John kind of a panoramic glimpse of the world. And, and now he is giving him a, um, a vision of what's going to take place as God opens up these uh, judgment events. We saw in Revelation verses, I mean, chapters two and three, the seven churches, the letters that were delivered to the seven churches and how uh, the Lord saw exactly what those churches needed. And he called out their sins. He gave them hope. He gave them uh, what they needed to do to repent and to be made right with him. And then in chapters four and five, John is taken to a vision um, in heaven. He sees God on the throne. There's worship happening all around God's throne. He sees Christ the Lamb on the throne. He sees all the worship happening around Christ on the throne. And then in chapter six, now we see Christ as the one worthy to open up the scroll or the book that will that will reveal the judgment that is to come upon the earth. So now that Christ, I'm reading from the handout here. Now that Christ, the one who is worthy, opens the seals of divine judgment, destructive events take place on the earth. Destructive events. It is important to remember that revelation is about the revealing of Christ. Right? Let's make sure that we get this set straight at this point in our study through this book. The book must be regarded as God-centered, not event-centered. Kind of like our churches, right? <laughs> we should be God-centered, Christ-centered, and not event-centered. But the book itself, as you read through it, let's not get sort of hung up on what the events are and trying to align them with what we see happening in our world. OK, let's let's understand that God is at the center of all of this, and that even as we see things happening in our world that we can relate to this, we see God who's in full in full charge of that. The opening of the seals, it shows God's sovereignty in orchestrating the events in the climax of the age. When we say sovereignty, what do we mean? What is sovereignty? In full control, full control. So let us not see these events as the world is making these things happen. Even as the world seems to be winning the day, everything is falling in perfect plan, according to God. It seems like it's not, but it is. When you look at this text that we're going to study tonight, what you're going to see clearly is that God is, is in full control at the center of all of this that has taken place. So um, the opening of the seals, again, shows God's sovereignty in orchestrating these events. They show the hand of Christ in opening the, the sealed book of God's dealing with humanity. All right. Now, here's what we're going to have to do again as we get into this so we can, we can learn and we can relate this to the uh, other parts of Scripture. Let's turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter 13. We need to know that, again, Revelation is not a book in isolation. It doesn't just have its own thing. Now, it, it, is a, it is a unique genre of scripture, but it still relates to other scripture. And so Jesus, he prophesied many of these things that we're going to study tonight in Revelation. So Mark chapter 13 verses 12 and 13 jesus in the midst of this giving of the signs of the end time of the end of the age he states here that there, there's going to be this this period of unthinkable things happening even among families and again we see that happening now sadly in some uh, some places but in verse 13, especially, he talks about 
how you, the you there, who's the you that Christ is talking to? Everybody that's before him, right? His disciples, his, his followers. And so he's saying you will be hated. Now, I believe that he does intend to refer to those who, who are listening to him because they will go through hatred, persecution, difficulty, problems, sufferings because of Christ, because of his namesake. But at the end of verse 13, what does the Lord say again? The one who endures to the end will be saved. So in the, in the midst of all of this mayhem and judgment that's taking place around them, the end times, he is telling the, 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 the Christians here and also, I believe he is helping us to see what judgment looks like. And as Christians face these things that happen in, the, uh, in these trying times, there is a call to endurance. There's a call to perseverance. There's a call to stay faithful. All right. So we see how Christ taught these, his disciples concerning these end times. And from this in parallel text, it is reasonable to see the breaking of the seven seals as, okay, as the precursor to God's judgment. I think I got my scripture. Anyway, don't worry about that. We'll, we're going to touch on it again. Um, we, it is reasonable to see the breaking of the seven seals as the precursor to God's judgment in the final end times event. Okay? All right, so again, as Christ called the disciples to endure to the end, he is telling us that there, there is going to be a, um, a sequence of these things happening, but uh, God's people are called to perseverance. Between Christ's first and second coming, military conflict will continue to terrorize humanity. Christians will be martyred and natural disasters will wreak havoc. All of these things will be taking place. Now let's turn back over to Revelation chapter 6. Let's see these judgments that are going to happen as the Lord does come. All right. And if you will, this is not on the handout, but this is, again, more of an introductory matter here concerning the judgment times that are coming. So we have three series of judgments that, that are given John sees these taking place in Revelation. There are the seal judgments, then the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. And there are seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. All right? B-O-W-A-L. Yeah, B-O-W-A-L, bowl judgments. And so the seal judgments, here's what I would propose, submit to you, okay? Other Bible students think differently about what these are, but when we read this, I believe I'll hopefully I'll prove my case in this. Seal judgments spread throughout world history and include greater affliction because it's going to talk about wars and famines. We've seen those types of things throughout world history, right? Although I believe that will be an intensification of those in the end days. The trumpet judgments, they uh, scatter over the latter days of world history during the time of the Great Tribulation. And then the bowl judgments, the bowl judgments are at the end because at the end of the bowl judgments, we are going to see in Revelation 19, the return of Christ. Okay? So, seal judgments, trumpet judgments, bowl judgments, return of Christ. Seven, seven of each. I'm going to show you how they overlap. I believe there is some, uh, again, when you read Revelation, Revelation it's not strictly chronological. That is why I think the dispensationalist view have difficulty because we're going to see that the seal judgments are open. He gets to six, and then there's a, there's a pause, an interlude. Then the seventh seal judgment is open, then it goes immediately into the trumpet judgments. And then there's six trumpet judgments and, and an interlude or a pause. 
And then we have the last or the seventh trumpet judgment. And then the bowl judgments happen at the end. And they go through and with rapid succession. And then it concludes with the Battle of Armageddon and the return of Christ. Okay? All right. This is a 30,000 foot of view here, right? As we look at these judgments, because between now, um, Re Revelation 6, all the way up to Revelation 19, we're going to be looking at these judgments, again, with interludes. All right? So we're, we're, we're in the midst of these judgment days here. All right? Here's a picture of it if you want to kind of visualize what it looks like. Again, the seal judgments, we have six of them we're going to read about in this chapter. The seventh seal judgment does not occur until Revelation 8, 5. Okay, so Re Revelation 6, we see six seal seals that are open. Then we have an interlude. Then the seventh one is in Revelation 8. Then we followed by the sixth trumpet judgment. And then we have another interlude. Until we get to, I think it's Revelation uh, 16 or I think 16, where we see the bowl judgments. We see the trumpet and with the seven bowl judgments. All right. Hope this is not confusing to you. I'm trying to make it as clear as possible to let you know that uh, we're going to see all of these things laid out for us. And um, it's going to be a terrible day. And. Um, <coughs> but God is still going to be in control, okay? Again, I believe there's some overlap in, these, in their fulfillments. And so the idea that things are happening on a chronological, on a strictly chronological order is, I don't believe, the right way to see it. Okay, so the seven seals. Um, again, we see the hand of Christ in opening these seals. I've talked about that already, so I won't spend time on that. All right. And so uh, we'll, we'll jump right now into these uh, judgments. Okay, so let's read Revelation 6, verses 1 through 8. Somebody want to read that for us? Thank you. Thank you for reading that well for us. Okay, so here we have in these verses four horsemen. Four horsemen, they are the dreads of human depravity. Okay, the dreads, the dreads of human depravity. We read this already. Okay, so the first blank there is that these are the dreads of human depravity. I say depravity because these judgments happen as a result of humanity being subjected to their own devices, okay? So, back in verse 1, who opened the first seal? The Lamb. So who's opening it again? The Lamb is it's Christ, okay? Jesus Christ. Good. So, and then um, it says that when it was opened, that he heard one of the four living creatures. What are the four living creatures? Have we seen those before? Okay, we did. We saw them back in Revelation 4 and 5. Okay, um, the first time that we saw them, uh, that was back in Revelation 4, verse 6, where it says the four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. We don't know exactly what these creatures are. They are, they are heavenly um, figures who factor prominently in the judgment that take place. And so any, any speculation as to who they are, I believe is just that, it's just speculation. So we don't really know. We just do know that they, they do um, obey the Lord here in carrying out uh, what is taking place in heaven. All right, so the first, what was the first seal? After Christ opened the first seal, what, what did uh, what did John see? A white horse. Okay. Anybody ever heard of the four horsemen? What have you heard about the four horsemen? I think there were some wrestling guys. Was that now? He doesn't like them. Okay. Okay. Four horsemen of the apocalypse. Okay. You've heard about that. All right. What what did they what did they do? What were the? They weren't nice. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay. Anyway, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, this is where it comes from. All right. This is where it comes from. All right. So there are the seal judgments. They, they, um, I would suggest that the, the four horsemen with these seal judgments represent the forces of God operating his judgment throughout history. If you read Zechariah, uh, you will see that he describes some horsemen there as well, although the colors are a bit different. But um, when we look at these colors, they do represent some characteristics about the rider. The first one. Okay, again, the fir the, this first rider uh, was, was like a conqueror on a military conquest. So the first white horse represents a military conquest. As he says here, that he, the one who sat on it had a bow. A bow was a weapon of military conquest. So what this seems to indicate is that the disjudgment has to do with, um, with there being military conquest of people and nations around the world, right? The rider was one who was one like, how, how did he describe the one who was riding? He had a, what, what was given to him? A crown. So he went out conquering. So this would be a conquest. Uh, powerful generals would go out, conquer other peoples, other nations, and would force them into a life of torment and difficulty. All right? Whenever there's a military conquest of another people or nation, it typically isn't for their good. In other words, the people who are conquered do not have better lives because they're coming. It's usually the opposite. All right. So um, we also need to understand that some would think, well, hey, this is a white horse. This has to be Christ. Well, no, because these four horsemen, they, they're bringing judgment in the sense that uh, they cause destruction uh, from Christ opening the seal. Christ is not at this point coming to bring judgment. Christ will come later on after these judgments have been rendered. All right. So, um, so this conquest here, I believe, is a deceptive type of matter. In other words, there's a promise of, of there being better human conditions from these conquests, and that doesn't take place. It's just a power-hungry a uh, nation or, or, or conqueror or dictator who's just out to control people and to gain power in the world, all right? So this is what takes place. Also, these forces of, e of, of evil, as it says here again, a crown given to him, this would be one who appears to be righteous. Now, some see this as the first mention uh, maybe a kind of a veiled description of the Antichrist who comes and also appears to be righteous, and, but he conquers um, many people, controls them. And so this is the first seal. A white horse brings military conquest, all right? The next horse is what color? Red. He's a, the text says that he's on a what? Um, He's on a fiery red horse, okay? So that fiery red horse, it represents slaughter and bloodshed. You're going to see how these four horsemen are connected. The first one, military conquest. What happens in that conquest? You've overtaken a people. You have, you have forced yourself onto them or your, uh, your power over them. But you're going to have to um, kill and bring bloodshed in order to fully carry out your conquest. There comes slaughter and bloodshed. That Again, that naturally follows war. Uh, that word slaughter, that refers to acts of butchery that would be used for killing sacrificial an animals. So you see this carnage here. 
So we've seen that throughout history, haven't we? We've seen bloodshed, we've seen carnage. Um, and it seems to shock us when people can do these types of things, doesn't it? I mean, most recently, uh, I mean, in the age that we're in now, things can happen and you can see it live streamed or people can post things to social media on the internet, but, uh, but there were, you know, there were some unthinkable things happening when Hamas invaded Israel. You know, there were people who were butchered and it was caught with, on, a, on a phone or a mobile device and they posted it because they were rejoicing over this, these evil acts. And, um, and he, you can imagine like through the times where there's been so much of these kinds of things going on. But, but this, this, is, this is the ugliness of humanity taking place here. This is, this is what judgment looks like. Also, I'm going to give this away before I get into the others as well, is as Christ is bringing this judgment, he's still opening the seals. He opened in, uh, this seal in verse 3, and then John was told to come and see, and then out comes the horse that reveals these judgments that, that are taking place. These are things that the Lord can allow to happen to bring judgment. In other words, the Lord doesn't have to bring the sword to bring these kinds of things. He, he, he just allows humanity to carry out what is on his own man's wicked hearts. And this is what we see here, okay? Let's look at the third horse, the third seal. All right, so again, to come and see, John looked and he saw a black horse. And the one who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. John said, I heard in the midst of the four living creatures saying, what a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. Okay, all right. So um, what is John saying there? This rider had a pair of scales in his hand. So this horse, represents widespread famine, widespread famine. So you have war, then you have uh, bloodshed, and then after that, what we have naturally? You've got famine, you've got a humanitarian crisis. So when he talks about the weighing of the food here, he is indicating that there is a shortage. Because if you're going to you're going to buy or sell food. You've got to weigh it specifically so you, because you have to ration it. So he's talking about there being a widespread need of food and not enough to cook, to take care of everyone. Um, because if you're going to weigh it, again, that weight is critically important. Every grain counts. Now, when he says here that um, a quarter wheat for a denarius, a denarius would be, um, known as a day's wage. Could you imagine w working and um, you got just a, a morsel of wheat for a day's wage? If I could put this in our today's um, situation, you work a full day and you can go to Kroger and buy, if they were to sell them, Two, two slices of bread to feed your family. Could you imagine that? So this is what was happening here, right, as, as these judgments were taking place. Again, warning on the wine also that indicates the provisions are scarce. The fourth seal, all right? Now, after war, after bloodshed and slaughter, after these, uh, th this widespread famine, next you're going to have a pale horse that would indicate death. Great death is taking place. He says, the name of him, him who said on it was death, and Hades followed with him. Now, Hades is not on a separate horse, I don't believe. I believe what naturally follows death is uh, the place of the dead, which is Hades, which is given here, a place of suffering. 
And this, um, this horseman is given uh, power to kill how much of the earth? A fourth, 25%. So what you see here is that things are in a very desperate situation as Christ allows these things to happen. All right? Okay. Well, I know it, this is heavy stuff here, but let's move on. That's good news. All right? Uh, let's read verses 9 through 11. So, again, in the first section there, we, we talked about the dreads of human depravity and what falls out from that great affliction. Here, we're going to see the fifth seal op uh, opened, and, and now we're going to see the martyrs in heaven, the martyrs in heaven. God's people continue to be slain because of their faith in Christ. Again, when the tribulation, when these judgments take place, God's people are seen as still suffering at the hand of these judgments. Or certainly being encouraged to stay faithful. Some will continue to suffer. So the souls of those who had been slain, where were those souls in verse 9? Where did John identify those souls as being? The altar. The altar. He has a picture here of a heavenly altar. So this is where you need some Old Testament uh, Bible, <laughs> some Bible study to catch you up here, right? In the uh, tabernacle or the temple, there was an altar. What was the altar used for? Sacrifices. What, uh, what, how did they do sacrifices at the altar? You don't have to give specifics, but just kind of generally speaking, what, what, what would they do at the altar? They were slaughtering animals. Blood. It was a bloody mess. Okay, They would take some of the blood and they would uh, put some on the horns of the altar and pour some at the, around the altar. That's the picture that is given here. So he talks about the martyrs, right? A martyr is a, um, is a person who has, who has died because of their faith in Christ, all right? They've died because of their faith in Christ. The word there for testimony in the, in the Greek, it actually is the word from which we get martyr. A martyr is just a witness. So he says they had been slain for what? Why were they slain? For the word of God and for the testimony in which they held. Can you imagine? Just because you follow Jesus Christ and you hold to his word that you could be healed. Does this seem like a far-fetched thing to us? It's happening in other countries around the world. Okay? Uh, Oh, for sure, yeah. The hatred, you know, because Christ did they talk about hating a person in your heart is like is murder. So you have in that level of murder, but in terms of the physical murder, um, we're not quite there yet. But um, you, I read articles, oftentimes of places like um, some of the places in Africa, some places in um, in the Middle East where where Christians are killed. Uh, and um, I remember this, um, India is really uh, a place of, of severe danger for Christians. Now, they, they showed, this, this person came to Mid-America when I was there, he was presenting on what was happening because again, we don't know or see, see these things happening. And it showed a picture that these Hindu terrorists had posted on the internet how they had tied this Christian to a tree and beat him to death. He showed some of that in chapel. It was gruesome to see. He was saying that this, this is what your brother or sisters are going through around the world. You know, you, you're, you're sort of, you know, you're hidden from these things. And, um, and, so, and so while we look at and talk about these things here in the, uh, in, in the text, these things are happening right now. Okay? Now, uh, this heavenly, this altar here was where, um, was where John saw these Christians. Now, uh, let's uh, see here that how 
Paul described himself as he was about to be martyred in 2 Timothy 4 and 6. You can turn with me as I read that, and you will see the parallelism of the language in Paul seeing himself as being poured out on an altar. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul saw himself about to be poured out on God's altar as a martyr for the faith. So when we go back to Revelation and we see here that it says, those John saw under the altar the souls of those that their blood had been poured out because of the testimony. Now, here was something interesting here that you also have to think about. There is an awareness in heaven of what's happening on earth. You ever thought about that? The souls of those who had been slain, they are observing what is happening on earth, right? Because they, they ask in a, a crowd with a loud voice in verse 10, what? How long? O oh Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. They, they see this judgment in play, but they want judgment. They want justice. There's a cry for justice. And so, uh, and so again, Paul saw himself as a drink offering. And so these saints of how long shows here that they're crying out for vindication. Vindication means um, they're, they're, they're crying for there to be uh, justice. They're not crying out for revenge. And for there to be justice is, um, is it should not be a vengeful cry because we know God is a God of justice, all right? All right, so, so how long would it be? Some would connect it that way. Um, I would see Hebrews 12 as referring primarily to the that hall of faith, the people that were being uh, mentioned as models of the faith. I believe that would be the cloud of witnesses. That's how I would understand it, but I would not have a problem with those who says that this is it's kind of the heavenly saints who see what is happening in time. But, but here clearly we see that there is an interest in the martyrs, those who li whose lives have been taken because of their testimony about them wanting God to bring justice, to vindicate the saints. So that's a great question, a great observation. And, um, and it can be, it depends on uh, the interpreter and how they understand those cloud of witnesses. All right, so, um, so there is, there's suffering taking place and, uh, and there is a cry for justice. So how long will, will it be? All right, verse 11, it says, what was given to them? A white robe. White robe was given to them that was symbolized bless, blessedness and purity. And it says in verse 11 that they should what? Last a little while longer. In other words, they can be at peace that God is, is going to carry it out in his time. Okay? 2F, the saints being told to wait a little while longer um, would indicate God's greater purpose on earth despite the evil that's rampant in it. So, so God is allowing this to carry on because he has a purpose even in allowing it to take place. We have a similar cry to God, right? When we see wicked stuff take place in the world. We want to know, Lord, how long do we have to see this? How long will it, will these kinds of ugly things take place and you won't come, God, to make this right? Do you ever get the sense, right? You see all kinds of rampant sin and 
And you wonder, like, how long will God just allow this to take place? Don't you want God to make things right, to fix the wrongs that we see in the world? Yeah, we do. And, and that's, that's, that's a good thing. We want to see, you know, tired of seeing people being treated unjustly and babies being killed and um, people being abused. We, we hate seeing that kind of thing where it seems the evil, you know, they, they, they live life good and, and the godly have a struggle in life. We want to see things made right. But um, we have to understand that God has a greater purpose on earth despite all of the evil that is running throughout this earth. Okay? It's he, the Lord tells them to just wait a little while longer until the number of your fellow servants and their brethren would be killed as they were. Oh, my goodness. He says, there's still more that need or that will die. Because what we see throughout church history is that some of the greatest moves of God happen when his people suffer in this way. Y'all remember back in Acts chapter, um, Acts chapter 8, after Stephen is stoned? What happens after that? The church spread. It's like if you have a fire, you're trying to stamp that fire out. The embers will spread out all over the place. Those embers will start more fires. That's what happens. You see, in Acts, the Holy Spirit, or Jesus, had told them they would, they would be indwelt by the Spirit, empowered by him, and that, and that they would be witnesses um, beginning in Jerusalem and in Samaria, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Well, well, the persecution was happening in Jerusalem, and as the saint, saints were scattered, guess what went with the saints? The gospel message, the gospel truth, the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to, yeah, I need to stop here, okay? And we'll, we'll pick up next week. But remember that there is an audience of saints who would receive this text in the first century. And so you had believers who had been martyred under Nero, Emperor Nero. They're going to be joined by those martyred on, under Domitian. Domitian is the uh, Roman emperor at the time of John's writing. And those afterward, even from the first century to the second century to the third century, all the way to the 21st century, right? God has a special place in glory for those whose lives have been uh, taken because of their faith in Jesus. All right? So we'll, we'll stop there. Um, and we, uh, I know this is a lot of... Uh, observation, but we're going to make this um, going to make this applicable. So actually the practical points are there at the end of the lesson. So you can look over those as we um, finish this off next next week. OK. All right. Um, any questions or comments before we close today? What's that now? <laughs> well, you know, what we see here, even in all of this, right, Christ is opening these seals. And even though we see these things take place on earth, heaven is all right. Heaven's all right. God's people are all right. Those in glory are in the presence of God. Yet he suffered on earth, but they're in the presence of God. But those on the earth are in view of God. God has his eye on them. All right. So, so, so better to be, uh, to be watched and to be cared for by God, even in times of judgment, than to be the object of God's judgment, which is the unbelieving world. All right. So this is what takes place in the last days. Again, Christ talked about that, and I. I think I got my scripture verse wrong. I got to go back and double check that. Uh, but when you uh, read in Matthew 24 and 25, and it's not Luke 2, it's Luke 21. So I know I, I made a mistake there. But um, 
But in those scripture verses, you see Christ talking about these things taking place in the end of the days. All right. And he even said, but the end is not yet. The end is not yet. So even though we see these things take place, they are a precursor to the end. That's why the, the rampant wickedness and evil that we're seeing in the world, I believe, is connected to a lot of these things that we see here in Revelation. Yeah, so that's a great point you, you, you've made, Brother Guillermo, is that when you get to Re Revelation 21, at that point, all God's judgment has been completed. It, it, it is, evil has been, has been done away with forever, for all eternity. And so that wiping away of the tears is, is, the, is what I would believe is that final moment when God's people come into his presence and the new heaven and new earth is brought into play and these judgments are in the patent. I mean, they have, they've done. They're never to be repeated. And so, and so but for now, uh, while even the world continues and God's people have to suffer at the hands of these types of evil deeds, they are still going to be crying in tears, fortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately. All right. And, um, and also, I'll, I'll say this. As we look at these judgments, be reminded of this. God can allow humanity to suffer the consequences of his own bad decisions. Humanity. Mm -hmm. That like you said that he is <laughs> okay, no, no. Yeah, let me repeat that. Yeah, let me repeat that. If God can allow humanity to suffer its <laughs> suffer its own consequences from from its bad decisions, its decisions, humanity's decisions. Yeah, yeah, because uh, you know, again, all, the war and all these things that that come from it is just the consequences of their own bad decisions. Right. So so God doesn't have to rain fire and brimstone from heaven to bring destruction. Just let humanity just suffer from their own self-destruction. They will implode in on themselves. And that's part. That's what we're seeing here. Right. Although Christ is at the center of these judgments taking place, he's just allowing humanity to suffer the consequences of its um, evil deeds. Right. So and also we see that conversely, that if we experience a preservation of good that happens, it's because of the goodness of God. That he does not allow us to suffer the consequences of our of our bad decisions. OK. All right. Sure. Yeah. Number two, A and B. Yeah. God's people continue to be slain because of their faith in Christ. Yep, they slain, yep. And then uh, B is the heavenly altar where the martyrs are sacrificed. It harkens the image of the sacrifice of blood poured on the altar, of blood. Yeah, God's people shed blood. Yeah. Uh, to, to F, yeah, yeah, sure. Actually, I just, well, I stopped off, but I'll give it to you here. The saints being told to wait a little longer would indicate God's greater purpose on earth despite the evil rampant in it. God is still carrying, carrying out his perfect plan and purpose on earth. And hey, listen, let's be thankful that judgment has not come. It didn't come before we got saved. <laughs> and there's some more people God won't save, God won't save before he brings judgment. All right, he does. So they're, they're going to be grateful to God that judgment didn't come before he, uh, before they were saved. Another one? You, you what now? You want to be, you want to be out of this thing, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, um, well, you know what we can also be confident in if God allows us to go through a very difficult time as Christians, like some of our forebears have, God knows how to get the greater glory out of it and to use it 
for a purpose that we can't imagine. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's true. That's true. Yeah, that's a good word. That's a good word. Um, sin is, um, yeah, it's not pretty. It's not fun. And, and when sin is played out, it, um, it brings just what we've seen already, death and destruction. Father in heaven, God, we thank you for tonight. And uh, Lord, just to, um, just to visit these um, hard and these important truths about what, ta what takes place in, in what has already taken place, Lord, that we've seen throughout history that uh, reflects uh, what, is, um, what is spoken of in the text. But also, Lord, what we have, um, or what we believe is, is going to be future, where these, these things will intensify. There will be a, um, uh, a, a greater moment, Father, where these types of judgments will uh, consume the earth and will torment humanity, Father. But may we see them, Father, as an understanding of of sin and, and evil and wickedness that uh, will have its day, but it is limited because ultimately you are in full control. Father, give your people confidence and, and grace to, uh, to stand in truth and to live for you, Father, despite the pressures of the world around us. We ask it now in Christ's name. Amen.